When we have been talking about with the naive T cell activation, we're going into more and better understanding of the mechanisms of how the immune system works as opposed to just the basic nuts and bolts of everything. And so to start this whole off, we begin with what's known as a priming phase. This is the phase where the naive T cells are going to be exposed to some type of a pathogen associated molecular pattern. And the things that we want to note is that the primary adaptive immune response is not initiated at the site of infection, right? This common misconception that a lot of people have. What we usually will have is some type of a breach in one of our lines of defense, so the first or second, and then the pathogen will be carried to the nearest lymph node and then obviously by the lymph and is going to be ingested by the resident uh, macrophages process presented to the T cells, but this is all of this stuff that we're talking about is usually happening at some type of a uh, secondary lymphoid organs. It could be a lymph node in the context of, say, like a tissue or a skin level infection. It could be the spleen if we're talking about the blood, and if it's a, you know, some type of a mucosal pathogen, some type of a mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, right? The tonsils, payers, patches, appendix, um, and then specifically the bolt if you're talking about the bronchioles. And so the, the primary antigen presenting cells that I talked about uh, at the very beginning of this course were dendritic cells. These are the most versatile antigen presenting cells. And while macrophages and B cells also function as antigen presenting cells. The dendritic cells, as we're about to find out, have a primary function. That is their, they have basically just one job, and that is their one job, whereas macrophages and B cells have other jobs, which we talked about later. And so this is a picture that was provided by previous students in this course, and I think these are actually med students. But anyways, it's a really interesting uh, picture showing the actual monocyte, uh, the myeloid dendritic cell, and then the CD8, and then CD, uh, which we'll talk about the different types of dendritic cells later on. But um, this just kind of shows you an illustration of deriving the Th1 and inflammation. We'll talk about what that means later, uh, and this over here just showing you, this is just kind of a preview of what we're going to be talking about sooner. Dendritic cells are key players in obviously the activation of naive T cells, and then the differentiation in to effector T cells. Uh, and they express a very distinct pattern of cytokines, and this pattern that they express and the cytokines that they produce give rise to a lot of that bridging the gap that I talked about earlier between the adaptive and the uh, innate immune system. So the dendritic cells obviously are adaptive and versatile at processing pathogens and antigens. Um, we all know about the whole phagocytosis, MHC class 1, MHC class 2 um, junk here, but I just wanted to bring up the, bring to issue the processes of cross-presentation that they have um, of both exogenous viral antigens here, and then they can actually transfer viral antigens from infected dendritic cells to resident dendritic cells, which we may, we'll see later on, plays a huge role because there's very few viruses, if any that I can think of, that directly infect and can propagate well inside of dendritic cells. Okay, so they're going to carry the antigens from the site of the infection, it's always a guy stepping on a nail for whatever reason, to the uh, secondary lymphoid tissues, in this context, the nearest draining lymph node, right? And so they're going to take the bacteria into the skin and then move it uh, into a draining ven lymphatic vessel, and then from there they're going to present it to the T cells, usually in the T cell areas, otherwise known as the T cell zones. All right, so again, here on the right, we see a really nice picture that was provided to us from medical students. Luckily, we're not in medical school, so we don't really have to worry about that so much, but it is a really interesting uh, diagram that just shows the movement of lymph nodes through the lymph node and then all the other associated cells that are involved in it. But I really wanted to focus more so on this picture here on the right. So what this is, this is showing the changes in the dendritic cell morphology from the site of infection, like we see up at the top, all the way down to being at the lymphoid tissues down at the bottom. And so some things that you may notice is that over here at the beginning, it's really globular, right? And then as it gets down, it starts to become more dendritic-like as it's developing dendrites. Uh, and then on the left side of here, um, with these diagrams here, what you're seeing in yellow is actually the MHC proteins that are being expressed and lysosomal proteins being accessed in, in the yellow here. And it's, as it starts to, you can clearly see that they start to express more and more MHC as they're starting to mature and get closer to the lymphoid tissue. We'll talk about how that happens later on. But before we get into that, let's talk about actual naive T cell recirculation. So after the infection occurs, our immune system must quickly bring the very small number of pathogen-specific naive T cells into contact with the pathogen's antigen. And when you think about it, that's actually really complicated to do because there's so many T cells, there's so many of them that are being produced, and we must be able to find a way to bring a very large, uh, be able to produce a lot of them that are specific for that pathogen at a very small area of space. 
And so the way that we do this is by the secondary lymphoid tissues. Uh, in this context, the lymph node, but remember if it's the blood, that's the spleen for that anyways. Um, but for a given infection, the naive T cells specific for a pathogen are going to number one out of 10 to the sixth power recirculating T cells. So I think as I talked about earlier in my videos on secondary lymphoid tissues, that this is just a way that we can get a, a kind of a hairy area of high traffic or area of high concentration where there's going to be a lot of collisions happening between the T cells that are naive and then the actual pathogen associated molecular pattern in this context being on the surface of the dendritic cell. Okay, so the naive T cells are going to exit the blood via the high endothelial venule CCR7 that's the receptor, meaning the R, on the naive T cells are going to interact with CCL21 bound to the surface of the high endothelial venules. They're going to encounter with antigen presenting cells upon entry, usually dendritic cells, right, because those are the main ones that are involved in this. Um, they're going to follow a gradient through this and uh, CCL21 and CCL19, which are both going to be produced in this context by the dendritic cells, which is going to lead them to it. And then they're going to maintain that cell contact by adhesion molecules, or adhesins, as I like to call them, because they're proteins. Uh, and each T cell is going to examine the peptide MHC complex using its own T-cell receptor, uh, and then if it encounters a complex which it recognizes, it's going to bind to and then ultimately become activated. And so what I like about this picture here that we have, I don't know why it's in black and white exactly, but we can see the T-cell right here, okay, and then on, in uh, the, I, think, I guess you would say it's orange type of color, we have the L-select in here. Here we see the CCL21 right there binding uh, and or the CCL19, this would be obviously the, I don't think they labeled it, but the receptor associated with it in green, which is CCR7. Uh, here's the LFA ICAM integrin cell adhesion molecule interaction, if you want to think about it here happening. And then this is showing the actual diapedesis, the actual squeezing through of the T cell as it goes into, and it's going to make contact with the dendritic cell. T cells that uh, do not encounter their specific antigen, which we see here illustrated in green, are going to ultimately end up leaving the lymph node and the efferent lymphatic system and eventually rejoin the bloodstream. Now, the T cells that actually do end up encountering an antigen that they're specific with, or on the types of antigen presenting cells that we've been mentioning, they're going to be activated and proliferate, and those are the ones that we're seeing here in blue. I don't know why my pen just like dislodge itself for a second there. But anyways, um, the only note that I want to make is that with the ones that we see that are usually the, the ones that don't make contact with this, uh, with specific antigen presenting cells um, that have them, are going to end up recirculating through the blood and then through the afferent lymphatic system. So inside the lymph node, the T cells uh, transiently sorry, bind to the antigen presenting cells via the integrins and the immunoglobulin superfamily interaction, which is kind of something we're about to talk about in the next chapter, but understand that this interaction here that they have to make them, in this context with the, the dendritic cells is facilitated strictly via the interactions with the integrins and uh, cell adhesion molecules. For naive T cells, litigation of the T cell receptor is necessary, but it's insufficient to trigger T cell activation, and we'll talk about why it's insufficient later on. So cell adhesion molecules, which again, revisit, we've talked about this earlier, um, is what a T cell does during and after contact with an antigen is controlled by their interactions with other cells. This is mediated by adhesins and integrins. Um, these include the selectins, the vascular addressins, integrins, and then the immunoglobulin superfamily. The only ones that are really new with this, as opposed to what we talked about with neutrophils, would be the uh, specific identities in each and every one of them, but they're, they're ultimately part of the same family because they do the same job.